God's call in the glory land. Welcome to Coffee and Connect with Larry and today co-host Marnie Snaza because Marnie's our secretary. She's been there now with us for 25 years. And you say, where's Gloria? That's what I was wanting to know. <laughs> Gloria is not feeling so well today. What's happened with her in this last few weeks, she's had four ablations. Yeah. She's had two cardioversions. And she's had an in interplantation of a pacemaker. Now, pacemaker, she, she's usually my pacemaker. Come on. Let's <laughs> do this, Larry. Go do that. <laughs> And so that's what's going on. And so we, we, we've we decided that we'll have fun today with Marnie and she can take it from her end and we'll do it here. And she's in South Dakota and we're in Tennessee. Yes, so, I know. And in talking to Gloria, she's just so excited that all of those procedures are behind her yes. um, and just so thankful for all the prayers of all of you who have um, just been there uh, during a time where it felt very endless. And so uh, just excited to see her feeling better day by day. And uh, the day then she is uh, back in the seat here, sitting by Larry as it's supposed to be. And um, we're, we're, we're looking forward to that as I'm sure you are as well, Larry. Yes, now Marnie, you were with us. You you came on the, on the video here so graciously and you told the folks what Gloria was going through mm -hmm. and want to know that I've been for, for weeks uh, in the middle of the night. She'll wake up and she'll she has the, the watch. She was able to get one lady that was a well-known, well-known nurse. Uh, she made sure that Gloria at no cost was able to get one of those medical watches. OK, and so, wonderful. Yeah. And so that watch, she'd wake up uh, 60 beats per minute was supposed to be like the heart rate and this was going up as high as 128 mm -hmm. and so it was really touch and go there and that's when you came on and we asked for prayer but now she's working and her heartbeat is right on the money now it, it, it's 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 right perfect the way it's supposed to be so we're hanging on and thanking God for it so yes, anyway yes, so you know we think about what we do as as evangelists, we try to take as many people to heaven with us as we possibly can get there. Because the Bible says the fields are white and ripe unto harvest. But it says the laborers are few. The laborers to go out into the, you know, there's a lot of people that know a lot about God, but there are those that will, pull, pull, we call, use the sickle and harvest. And those are the ones God says that harvest is the fields are white and unto harvest and the labors are few. So we're always trying to take as many people, your friends. That's why if you need to send a copy of this, you can email it over to them or whatever mm -hmm. you do. I'm not the computer guy. <laughs> anyway, so that's what's happening. And there's a lot of people that we're talking about that that uh, I've been at funerals. I've been every place. And there's a lot of people. Uh, get caught up with assumptions. The devil tries to trick people into assumptions. Now, what is an assumption? Assumption is a, something that's kind of believed by a lot of people, uh, is accepted, and as far as they're concerned, it's certain, but there's no proof for it. That's there's really no, good. That's really good. No proof. And so what your, your assumptions have to have is it has to have the backing of scriptures. It has to be, if you if you have a belief, you got to be able to prove it with scriptures. And so the, a lot of people, their number one assumption is, I'm going to heaven. You know why? Because I'm a good person. But the Bible says, and I think it's over Romans 3, 8 to 10, it says there is none good. No, not one. Mm -hmm. All we like sheep have gone astray is another scripture. Each one has turned to his own way. And another scripture over in Isaiah 64, 6 says, it says all of our righteousness, our self-righteousness is as filthy rags in God's sight. But oh, God comes up. And so this is where when I preach, 
whenever I tell people, because, you know, the night when uh, God delivered the children of Israel out of Egypt, there was one that's going to be the 10th plague that was going to hit. And this plague was going to be the death of the firstborn. Whether you're a Jew uh, in the land or you were one of God's people, mm -hmm. what they were instructed to do, they had to go find a lamb and butcher the lamb. And with that lamb, they would bleed the blood into a, a basin or a pail, and they would take a hyssop, which is a branch, and they had to apply the blood over the doorpost. Because you see, with that death angel was going to come down the street about midnight. And if, when he saw the blood, it says, when I, that's why that, I love that old song we sing. When I see the blood, I will pass, I will pass over you. And when we see that blood on the doorpost of our hearts, the death angel will pass over us. And that's why the, that's what broke the back of Pharaoh and drowned the whole Egyptian army eventually in the Red Sea was, was the fact that, that it took the firstborn, his son, Pharaoh's son, he, then he would let the people of Israel go. And so that's kind of what the deal is, the assumption. Uh, you probably have some friends that you know some assumptions that you're in, Marty. Absolutely. You know, just I think a lot of us can have the assumption that just because our grandparents or our parents um, serve the Lord, you know, they're faithful, they're attending church, they're, uh, you know, even maybe bringing you to Sunday school or youth group. Um, you know, you can easily um, come with the assumption that you're good to go. I mean, you're, you're in, you're yeah. in the church. You're, you're, you're where the Lord is. Obviously he lives within us, but you know, that that's, the church has the steeple, the, the cross on it. It's the sign, you know, this is where God is present. And there was a, a line that I heard from a, 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 a dear pastor friend, and he would just say, well, just because uh, you're standing in the garage, right you're in the garage it doesn't make you a car and just like that's so true you know just because you're in the church doesn't make you a christian and so um, i think we can have the assumption that just because we're doing those things um even godly things that we're good that we're you know that our hearts are right but if we haven't surrendered our lives to jesus christ and made that relationship real between you know god and us specifically not just relying on our parents relationship or our grandparents relationship um we have a wrong assumption that we're good with the lord yeah i was looking at this and there's a way it's over in uh proverbs 14 verse 12 it says there is a way which seemeth right unto a man but the end thereof are the ways of death there's a there's a way that seemeth right that's an assumption. That's right. Yeah. That's an assumption. That's kind of like take it for granted or or I suppose, you know, those mm -hmm. are words that would be synonyms to that. And so I was thinking about how my mother had an uh, assumption. And and usually, you know, we weren't angels as kids because. Uh, <laughs> I have, now that's a hard thing to believe, Larry. <laughs> no, we weren't angels. But whenever we would get doing something that mother didn't like, she would raise her voice and kind of yell. She'd yell at us and she'd say, and it was because of her upbringing in her culture, she would say, God gonna punish you. Now, my mom's assumption was God, and was God was the God in the sky with the stick waiting to get everybody because of what the things that they've done wrong. Somehow she learned that, whatever she went to, I don't know. But anyway, that was that was her assumption. But now if you were to ask if she was here today, she's gone into heaven years ago, about 2000, she went there. Uh, she would tell you that is definitely not the way it is, that there's God is love. And she found Jesus as her Lord and Savior. She was saved. And a neighbor, our neighbor lived a quarter of a mile from our house. And uh, and we always talk about when we come to Christ, which we did, we got saved. Getting saved. I had never heard that terminology until I was 12 years old. 
never ever heard anything. But then it was frustrating for me because I would go to, I would go to after I found the Lord as my Savior. I was so excited about it. I had to tell everybody about it. And then I would go to these other kids in school, and I couldn't understand. They didn't want to talk about the subject. They were, it was not impressive to them. They didn't know what saved was no more than I did. But they knew what church was. And I think that's kind of where you're coming from. Yeah, exactly. They knew what church was, but they didn't know what being saved was. So my mother thought that. And then would you believe I had an assumption? My assumption. Huh? What was your assumption? My assumption truly was. Trying to think of what heaven would be like, how you'd get to heaven, where you'd go, and what the, all that stuff. I had no idea because the Lundstrom family, we did not go to church. We, My mother was a one church background as a child, and my dad really didn't go to church, but uh, his, his mother was connected to a smaller group. And so uh, they couldn't agree, so we didn't go to church. And so what was happening was is that I th- the only way I could come up with anything that would make sense, I thought if your good deeds were a lot more than your bad deeds, you stand a chance of getting to heaven. And if your bad deeds were more than your good deeds, which I was sure mine were, <laughs> then you're going to go to hell. So I had no. So when I heard the gospel for the first time, there was there was no spoof in there because I knew what would happen to me if. If I would die, I know where I would go. Because then we have this, well, Romans 8, 16, there's a beautiful scripture that says this. It says, for the spirit itself bears witness, witness with our spirit that we are the children of God. This was the question. This is what almost angered me when I was young. All these churches, all these different names on it, and you talk to them all. Matter of fact, the one that my grandma went to, I've said that before, but the one that my grandma went to, uh, I asked someone that went to that same church, do you believe in your church that if you die, that you can know that you go to heaven? He said, no, we don't think you can. So to me, why would you want to take and live your life, spend your money, give your money, working on volunteer programs or do whatever that churches do, and not even know you're going to get there. Mm-hmm. To me, that was that was really sad. So we have these these assumptions, and then of course the second thing was not only the assumptions. The devil tried to get you with assumptions. Secondly, uh, he'll try to get you with choice. He says, "Behold, I stand at your heart's door and I knock." He knocks at our. He wants to come in. He wants us to choose him to allow him. To give him the control. It's kind of like get out of the driver's seat and let him in, and you get in the back seat. He wants that's the type of commitment that he wants from us. And so, with with that going on, uh, uh, we need to make. The, I think it was Joshua drew a line in the sand. Yeah. He drew a line in the sand, and he he saw because they were wavering with their commitment, because way up in the mountain, I. I they, uh, Moses was up on top of the mountain and he went up there with God and he got the Ten Commandments, but he was gone longer than they thought he should have been. And so what did they do? They took all that gold they had out of Egypt and they made a gold, got Aaron, the preacher, got him to make a golden calf. And they were rioting. They heard when, as Moses come down the mountain, he heard the rioting and, and the screaming and the, it was kind of a bad deal, bad deal going on. And so when he saw that going on, uh, oh, it really, he, then he had to melt down the golden calf and put it in the river and all of that stuff. But there's a choice. Mm-hmm. And, and so we have to make that choice. Uh, like Joshua drew the line in the sand. He says, Who's, who of you will be on this side? That's for me and my house. We will serve the Lord and we're going to be on the other side. Mm-hmm. Yeah. I was listening to, um, I actually just this morning on my way into work, there was a, a program on and, and 
They were just talking about how one of the things that is common through every society, whether it's in the current age in which we live or whether it is, you know, in the archaeology archaeological digs, you know, where they're, they're discovering um, these, these cultures and these peoples, and there's a common thread throughout them all. And one of the things that they find is you will find something to worship. You know, they're, they're finding either idols or some form of something, you know, now I'd say that, you know, humanity worships either themselves or their minds, you know, like their knowledge, Um, Uh, but, but you're going to find something to worship. And so I've been reading in uh, Chronicles and Kings that kind of, they're being tied together in my reading plan. And, and we're reading right now, or the, the slot where we're at is where King Josiah has been made king. And as they're going through that, uh, you know, everything that the kingdom had, you know, they would have a righteous king in Hezekiah. Then they had, I think it was Manasseh yeah. after that. And then, you know, and it's just, it's it's like a ping pong game. Yes. <laughs> you're coming back, you're like, we're going to serve the Lord. We're going to be evil. We're going to serve the Lord. We're going to be evil. And what they found out is in all that time, you know what they lost? They lost the word of God. And so in King Josiah's time, they discovered the word of God. They found the scroll in the temple that, you know, had been mislaid, I guess. And, And so they read it and they discover how far that they have come because yes. they, they, they're sitting there. And as you're reading, you're, I, like my mind just doesn't even process that in the temple of God, they had erected these uh, poles, Asherah poles, and had uh, places for the temple prostitutes to be. And yeah. all of this was going on in the temple of God. We're going to find something to worship. We want yeah. to make sure we're worshiping the one true God, the one that actually saves us. Yes. But assumptions, you know, the, uh, the, the, I thought I was thinking about assumptions and then I got thinking about we have to make the choice. And then there was a, something that always has bugged me for a long time. And I couldn't, I couldn't really assim, assimilate this. And that is when the thief was on the cross, he did something. He, he became an observer. The one thief keep cur- kept on cursing, and the other thief says, this man had done nothing wrong. He watched what Christ did, how he prayed, Father, forgive them, for they know not yeah. what they do. And he, he watched how this, how they, what they mocked him, and, they, and finally he told the other guy, uh, he, says, he says, be quiet. He says, he says, we're up here. We deserve what we're getting. This man had done it, nothing wrong. So the Bible says you believe in your heart. Well, he started believing when he's on that cross. Mm-hmm. He didn't have a good work to look back on. He did nothing good anywhere. That's why the Bible says there's all we like sheep have gone. We've all done evil. There's not one that's good. And especially the thief on the cross. Then when he looked down, and then finally he said, he, he took all he could take of it. And then he looked over and he says, he says, remember me. He says, when you come into your kingdom, and by observing what was happening, he could see the hate. He could see the, the cursing. He could see all of this. He could see an innocent man through that observation changed his life. And Jesus said, today, you're going to be with me in paradise. That's and powerful. So, that's powerful. Because Jesus said, you know, uh, you know, as you see, if they, uh, they observed, if they would observe, like, for instance, Lazarus, uh, Jesus said, I have, I have the power to lay down my life. I have the power to take it again. He says, I'm going to die. And then he says, the third day I'll rise again. And so they really believed what Jesus was saying. Why would they put 16 Roman guards around a dead man's tomb? Mm-hmm. And then they send out, when they found out Jesus did raise from the dead, they send out the Sadducees that were the Sadducees don't believe in a, a life after death. 
And there's one now just just coming. Not only did he raise Lazarus, but now he raised from the dead himself. And so, and they don't believe in life after death. They don't believe in angels, spirits, any of that stuff. And you would think, you know, I think what they should have done is, hey, boys, we need to have a little uh, organizational, get the Sadducees general council together, and we need to vote on what our bylaws are here a little bit because something's off here. (laughs) Because I saw the guy that was dead, and we helped kill him. Now he's alive again. Mm -hmm. And so to observe all these different things of what's happening when they – the little girl, Jesus raised the little girl. The guy comes into, can you imagine when was the last time in the temple where the guy comes leaping and dancing and praising God? When was the last time they, they saw a worshiper like that? Mm-hmm. And so there was the, to observe what was taking place. And a lot of times we have to observe what Christ has done. That's why a lot of people get saved. You know why they get saved? I saw what happened to Bill over here, how God moved his transformation. They're so different. They there yes. there can be no explanation for for their difference in who they are except for a supernatural, you know, encounter, yeah. something that changed the very uh makings of who they are on the inside. And we had a neighbor that lived a quarter mile from us and uh we tried to witness to him as we possibly could and everything, but uh, didn't have too good luck at, uh, at that up front. But one day he said something that was very interesting. He says, I knew something happened to the Lundstroms. And we said, how is that? He says, my mother, uh, before she came to Christ, was a chain smoker. Mm-hmm. And she was absolutely worry wart to the max. If if the if the quarter mile the other way, the tractor would come on the little section line road to come home with equipment behind it. She'd be on the out in the middle of the yard screaming, "Kids, get out of the yard! The tractors are coming!" She just was she was just absolutely uh, paralyzed with that fear. That was happening. He says, I knew something happened to the Lundstroms. Madge wasn't out in the yard screaming anymore. Mm-hmm. So that was all that was happening, going on. So so when you begin to observe what what happens, uh, how lives change uh, with, with the Lundstroms, uh, that was when I was 12 years old. That was the last day that there was ever a curse word in my mouth. Wow. And I had just gotten in with some of the, kind of you say, uh, high school, a little older than high school. Mm-hmm. And the, just about a few days before that, uh, they were just starting to loosen up to be willing to let me share the bottle with them. Mm. And uh, if I would have kept going that way, if God hadn't come into my heart, uh, I could have been an alcoholic today. Mm-hmm. But that went. And so all the difference, if any man be in Christ Jesus, he is a new, new creation. creation. Yeah. All things are passed away. Mm-hmm. Behold, all things. Mm-hmm. all things. And the thing is, is that I love to tell I love, there's a song that goes like that. I love to tell the story of Jesus and his love. I love to tell the story because what happens is uh, uh, people like what we've been talking about think if I'm a better person, if I'm good, I'm going to get there. That doesn't wash away a a drop of sin. Mm -mm. None of that. Well, there's only one sin remover ever known to mankind. It says, in I believe it's, Hebrews 9, 27, it says, without the shedding of blood, there is no remission for sins. Mm -hmm. There has to be blood. And that's why when John introduced Jesus uh, at the River Jordan, he says, behold, the Lamb of God, which takes away the sins of the world. 
In other words, that's why Jesus came was to die for us. And so that's what he wants. And, and to know that, you know, when you when you come to this spot, when you realize, uh, you know, you realize that Satan in the Garden of Eden, he was able to get Eve, first of all, to eat of the forbidden fruit because she assumed it was okay. okay. Mm -hmm. She assumed that it was, it was pleasant to the eyes, tree to be desired to make one wise. It, she assumed that that was going to be a great, a great fruit. And, then, and so the assumption, then she went on. And then it, when, when I talked about blood, then when Jesus saw that, uh, or when God the Father, God Jehovah saw that they had sinned in the garden, it says he made them, he made skins. Well, what was inside those skins? There was animals. And without the shedding of blood, there is no remission for sin. There had to be bloodshed for the sins of Adam and Eve. And that's why with the, you know, all of this that we go along, we want people to get to heaven. But they think I'm going to be a better person. I'm going to go to church, all of that stuff. And we find out that all of that doesn't work. But what if you, the Bible says, if we repent, what does repent means? I kind of, sometimes I rehearse my repentance because I go back and say, oh God, you know, there may have been something there. Lord, if the Holy Spirit knows of something in my life that shouldn't be there, I confess it, mm -hmm. I forsake it, I turn from it, I want you to come into my life and wash that iniquity and that sin away. And then that peace that passes, the Bible says you can't comprehend it, it passes all understanding, comes into your heart and life. So that peace, and now that peace, everybody can have that, but you have to, you have to be willing, whosoever shall call upon mm -hmm. the name of the Lord. So there has to be a call. There has to be a belief. He that believeth in the Lord shall be saved. He that believeth not shall be damned. So you don't want that. So there's got some things, but those aren't difficult things. Those are things that will only bring the blessings to you. Mm -hmm. And so if you're here today and uh, oh, I tell you, you're tuned in, maybe you know of a friend that needs to hear what we're talking about. Uh, they can then, they can, uh, you talk about those little three little dots up in the right corner and they can get that and they can send this program to their friends and say, hey, what this guy is talking about, I think we should listen to. And so let's let's pray today. If, you, if you're there and, and you know that God wants to talk to your heart, he wants to become closer than the very breath in your mouth, pray this prayer with me. Say, Heavenly Father, Heavenly Lord, I want you to come into me. I want you to come into my heart. I want you to save me. Forgive me of all my sins. I denounce the devil in all his ways. And I accept the blood of Jesus Christ, the Lamb of God, as the sacrifice for my sins. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. That was an amazing message, Larry. Thank you so much for sharing it with us today. The assumptions that we have, they are without proof. The only thing that provides proof is the word of God. And uh, we have the choice to make. What God are we going to serve? Are we going to serve the true living God? And lastly, what observations are you making? Are you seeing that Jesus is real and that he's the only one that can bring salvation? So we will have this uploaded by the end of the day to www.larrylundstromministries.org. Uh, just click on the big CC Live, uh, Copy and Connect Live banner on the front page. It will take you to all of the CC Live videos. And to share it as Larry uh, suggested, just click in the top right hand corner, the three little dots. Uh, it will open up the link and you can share it by email, text, Facebook, however you would like. All right. Well, Larry, I think we did it. What do you think? I think we got it. 
<laughs> yes. So we will hopefully have Gloria back with us for the next Coffee and Connect Live. And until then, take care and uh, may God bless you. Bye. Bye-bye. About 50 years ago in South Dakota, the Lundstrom's knelt in prayer to God one night. There the Savior sent us with the message that we should sing about eternal life. We've been rolling down that long, lonesome highway, traveling to help our fellow man. And we'll keep traveling on, singing happy song until we hear God's call to glory land. We've met a lot of friends in all our travels. We're so blessed. We know their prayers have helped us stay alive. And we're so thankful. So if you ever feel impressed to mention my name, then you know it's my turn to drive. We've been rolling down that long, lonesome highway, traveling to help our fellow man. And we'll keep traveling on, singing out. Song until we hear God's call to glory land, and we'll keep traveling on, singing a happy song until we hear God's call to glory land.